Welcome into this, uh, I almost said the snap podcast. That's my personal podcast about fitness and exercise. If you want to go listen to that, Washed Up Walk-Ons is this podcast. Today we have David Eichel joining us. This is the first edition, the first installment, whatever you want to call it, of the Tuesday Presser Review Show. There's not really a good name for it. Basically, for those that don't know, <laughs> AF, KF hops on the hops on the mic. I think the other, do, do the coordinators sometimes come out there too? Like during the season? Uh, about once. So they changed it two years ago. Now we get one assistant per week over Zoom on Wednesday mornings as well. Okay. Uh, those are usually a little bit less notable for the most part, but we only get coordinators about once once or twice a year, once during the football season. But obviously with everything last year, we didn't get Brian. And after he was already let go, it was kind of – there's no yeah. point in him facing the media in my opinion. No, no. Uh, so – Whoever whoever they bring out on Tuesdays, they're going to do a press conference. It's usually about a half hour. Our guy, I Colt here, he's there along with all the other uh, beat reporters and, and, and media. I thought, what a better way to bring a little to bring a little extra to the washed up walk-ons than to break down that press conference. There's going to be some every week there will be something big, injuries, matchups, drama. Connor Stallion stealing signs and getting a game ball for figuring out the Iowa offense, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> um, so we're going to bring David in each week, and he's going to help us. This is going to be a 15- to 20-minute podcast, although I say that it'll probably bleed over. Um, I do want to mention as well, though, as you guys listen to this, it's Wednesday. I'm going to put this out right after we record. Two days from now, we're going to be at Back Pocket Brewery for a little kickoff of the season, Fry Fest live podcast show. David is if all goes to plan, he's going to stop by, drink a beer, and join us on that show as well. It's going to be a little bit more official, David, than last year. We have, uh, we're going to have a tent. We're going to be outside. We'll have a little walk-on backdrop. We'll have a table to sit at. We're up. We're upgrading the set this year. Nice. So you'll actually have nice. a place. Well, to I, I think I think you guys yes. should be should be outside though too. I mean, because so many people were trying to listen last year, and it just felt like everything was so crammed in. But it, it obviously worked out. It was a great turnout. It worked. Great turnout. We love, we can't wait to see the rest of the people this year. We're going to have like a legit speaker that people can hear. It's not going to be cramped. People can sit, enjoy the day. Hopefully it's beautiful weather. It's supposed to be, I think high of 81 or something like that. So let's get to the show. Yesterday we got to talk or you guys got to talk with Kirk for the first time. We'll call it in season uh, other than maybe the camp media day, uh, which I do want to go back to, to last week. We have a, we have a self-imposed ban I, I don't know how to I don't know how to air yeah. quote that. I saw somewhere that it was in recommendations or like in conjunction with the NCAA or also recommended by Beth. Can you decipher that? What what exactly did that look like? Yeah, so I mean, obviously they are not talking right now much about anything because it's still an open NCAA investigation. But like, let's put it this way: Iowa and Beth are trying to get out in front of everything. I think okay. they're trying to. I don't want to say save face, but they're trying to show of good faith. Like, Hey, we know what? Yeah, we messed up. Let's just give KF and John Budmeyer the one game suspension. And of course, if you listen, go back and listen to that press conference last week, it sounds like that it's still possible that KF could be suspended longer. I still think that's very, very unlikely. I don't think that's going to happen. But the other thing is this is just the tip of the iceberg, not from Iowa, but for the entire country, because if you think Iowa is doing anything that any other program across the country is not, that's delusional. This is just part of the new normal at this point. Think about this. The Oklahoma assistant yesterday, DeMarco Murray, he suspended one game for tampering now. He's been added to that list. So as the season goes along, do not be surprised to see other programs and other coaches be suspended for a game or two. This, this really is only the tip of the iceberg. I only played in the Iowa program, so I don't know about other programs, but I know the people that are in the Iowa program. They're of pretty good morals and uh, yeah, um, code, we'll call it. They like to follow the rules, uh, probably more than some would like them to. I, I've definitely seen sentiments out there in the past of like, if everybody else is doing it, we need to do it too. We got to compete. Yeah. All, all these fans, we want to be able to compete with Ohio State and Michigan and now Oregon, the West Coast teams. We we, we should be doing this too. Um, Kirk and them do it right. And it it's a through line because 
who else would come out and self-impose a ban, right? Like no coaches are going to do that. You don't, if, if you're a seven year old kid and you steal from the candy store, you don't own up to your mom and say, Hey mom, sorry, I stole this. You didn't know, but sorry, I stole this. I'm going to put myself in a 15 minute timeout. You don't do that. But yeah. Kirk is that guy. And I don't know, maybe Beth had, it, it, I, I kind of forgot that it's still an open investigation. So that, that does add a little bit of drama to it. Like, well, the NCAA could just say, nah, screw it. That's not enough. Um, I, it totally depends on what else they find because it, I'm only going based off what I know right now. I mean, no, like you said, knowing KF, knowing a lot of the staff, I would be very surprised if there were actual layers to this. Yeah. And, and to be fair to KF, he talked about the other day how it was like a gray area and he did step on the line, but he said, yeah, it was a gray area. It's a murky area. And that's absolutely true. I mean, let's go back to you and I talking a year ago. What did I say? I said, it's getting, this is a totally normal thing. And the reality is nobody knows what the rules are, even the coaches, because it's just changing by the day. So the fact that the the NCAA is trying to form any sort of consistency and use Iowa as an example, it's hilarious to me because if you want to see what actual tampering and everything looks like, go down the SEC. Go, go check out, because I can tell you this, I think Brad Heinrich said it too. There were programs that were backdoor channeling to try to get some guys off Iowa's defense during the last football season. Yeah. From what I've been told. Not surprising. Not surprising. I think, and that's, that's where, that's where the extended investigation is. It, that's why it's still open because I think that you're basically looking at it. It could go a million different ways, but you're, you're basically looking at it in two different ways. It, Kirk and them are saying, Hey, I did think it was funny that he he said he's been a little bit more open recently. Uh, basically, yeah. since we'll you know we'll keep we'll keep the time or we'll leave with the pig. They can have the timeouts, right? Um, I mm-hmm. feel like we've gotten a little bit more of a snarky, um, spicy Kirk. We'll call it. And when the gambling stuff happened last year, he was not shy to basically say the NCAA has no idea what they're doing. This is like, he was very open about how that was just a total cluster. Yep. And he, he kind of dabbled with that here and said, you know, I stepped on the line. It's a blurry line. It's a very blurry line. So like, it's pretty easy to step on, but I stepped on it, you know, taking responsibility. And I think it's either pretty much. Okay. And I, you know, Cade said it in the podcast. I don't know if that's where this originates from. He's like, yeah, I, my guy at Wisconsin that is now at Iowa, I had a relationship with him and that's how we kicked that off. Is it, it's probably safe to assume from at least at this point that that's all it was is Cade started looking around. He started having conversations before he was supposed to, uh, before he was in the portal with Bud Meyer. And that was probably it. Or you got some real tampering going on where it's uh, teams are on the offensive where extended periods of suspension would be warranted if KF or Bud Meyer uh, were actively poaching a guy like McNamara before he even thought about it or made the decision. So um, it's interesting. Somebody I'd comment- also like to add too that Michigan is not the people that turned Iowa into the NCAA. And I, I saw that as well, which – I guess it's nice to know. It's 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 like okay, well at least it's they're not context being, at least. It's probably you know. uh, that's fair enough. I, f- f- you know, they stole our signals for two years, uh, so you know at least don't yeah. turn us in for something that we did, right? Yeah. Um, okay, let's get to a little bit of what happened yesterday. Early question, of course, is Kamari Moulton is at the top of the running back chart, and KF mentioned that part of. The, a large part of that was because LaShawn Williams had been dinged up in camp uh, for the, for the walk-in listeners out there. Injuries and health is a massive part of the game that I think honestly goes under talked about uh, when, yeah. when it, when it comes to success of teams and their potential. Um, but next man in mentality, Kamari Moulton, he got a few flashes last year and now he takes over as the RB one spot. We heard Lester as well. Talk a little bit about him just having a knack for a specific um a specific thing that they want to do with this offense. And it really opens them up. Um, but, and I'm not I, great. I can't wait to watch Kamari play, but it, it begs the question. Jazz Patterson has been very good in the past. Caleb Johnson is unbelievable. Uh, LaShawn Williams is great. 
do we have like one of the best, deepest running back rooms in the Big Ten this year potentially? I, I would argue that, but it's also like what's the ceiling uh, of the running back group? I think there's not going to be much drop off from one to four, and I think different guys bring different skill sets. So a little bit on Kamari Moulton. This is a guy that I've been hyping up since spring. This is one of my fastest risers. I heard a lot about him. And the big deal for me was he's put on about 20 pounds. Because go, standing next to him and interviewing him last year, Tyler, he was like an AAU point guard. He was built like that. He just wasn't really ready to go in between the trenches. Yes, he's a little bit shifty, has great vision, but it was very apparent he needed to put on strength. So now he's weighing in at about 197 to 198 after being 177, 178 last season. Wow. He has a knack for a certain play. Tim Lester's changing up some things in the style that I was running the football. I think Kamari Moulton fits best with where Lester wants this to go. LaShawn Williams is the most consistent back in the Iowa room. I think he's the guy that, you know what, I don't know if he can really take the top off the defense. I'm not sure, you know, how consistently he can have explosive runs. Now he has. I'm not, I'm not trying to shortchange him on that. But that's the guy that will give you four to five yards of carry. You know what you're getting. There's consistency there. Jazz Patterson, I still think, has dealt with a couple little dinged up injuries. And I think, you know, I think you need to give credit to Moulton. I think it's more about Moulton's ascendance rather than other players and experienced guys taking a step back. So I think you just need to give credit to Kamari. But here's my question that I wanted to ask you, being a former player in the program. Because what I've heard about Caleb Johnson, not me indicting him at all, because we've seen him be tremendous in games, have some game-winning runs, that, that run against Purdue. Or is it either Purdue or Illinois? He had that 35-yard touchdown that really secured the game. But what value does KF and the staff take in being a prominent and good practice player? Uh, a lot. Yeah, they, they, they love if you look good in practice. I think that's Caleb Johnson's biggest issue right now. I just, and it's not from a lack of effort. It's not from a lack of physicality. It's not from a lack of skill set. I just don't know if he knows how to be an elite player in practice to raise the ceiling that he has as a player. Breaks that mold. Okay. I think then we're going to see that kind of all Big Ten caliber running back that I think you expected, that I expected. And he's going to play, and he's going to have some major runs this season. It won't surprise me if he wins a game for Iowa. And the other part is, yes, it's a big deal that Moulton is the starting running back. But, Tyler, you know this as well as I do. With that deep of a room, they're going to feed whoever has got the hot hand. Yeah, I I looked at it. I saw it come out, and I, too, it was like it was the one thing your eyes are drawn to. And, you know, go, coming into the season, he probably is number four on, like, how much do we know about him as a common fan? Yeah. Right? Yep. And to me, knowing that – and it's probably easier for me because I trust these guys on the inside. I trust the program. There's a lot of people who are probably like, no, I don't trust the coaches. Like they have this general skepticism. If they're putting him at number one on the depth chart, and we've already seen the capability of what the other three guys can do. That was what came to my head was like, this is just a, sure. this is simply just a, and I think even more so with the potential of what Lester's trying to do with this offense. I think this is a molten or Johnson or Williams or absolutely it's it's literally yep. just we got four horses back there and I feel good with all of them and it reminds me a lot of when we had in 15 Kanziri and Wadley and LaShawn Daniels yeah. and Derek Mitchell we just had f you know not one guy is Jonathan Taylor but we have four that are division one starting running backs and and they're all different yeah they're all different that's the best part about it Kamari Mullen's hands have gotten better he's improved as a pass blocker Jazz Patterson had some great pass protection Huge. reps last season if Caleb Johnson can piece that part together I think that's where his next step is evolving he's had some big runs then obviously LaShawn Williams been the most consistent guy so I'm right there with you they don't have that one First team all American, you know, first team all American, first team all Big Ten back. But guess what? They got four guys that can pop off for a hundred yards any game. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's a good problem to have. And uh, if you know the one of the storylines is the the offensive line now finally has all this experience. Uh, KF said the words. Let me see. Versatility 
and flexibility on the offensive line this year, more so than we've uh, more so than we have had the opportunity in the last couple of years. That's another good thing. That's a huge thing that we've been looking for. Um, so maybe with a better offensive line, that running attack could look totally different. Throw in that it's going to be a bunch of different plays and schemes that Lester, I mean, it's, it's going to be, I think we're in for a treat personally, and I'm getting very excited, obviously, as you can hear me talk about it. I think there's two other things I wanted to highlight from this. Um, obviously, KF isn't going to be there. We talked about the ban, uh, but this has implications on decision-making, obviously. And when you have a different head man for the day, which is going to be Seth Wallace, uh, obviously huge fan of him on this podcast. What do you think the, um, you know, let let's let's just say that k doesn't do well or like what what is the i think the question really is here like what if Cade is horrible or what if what if he gets hurt again like what if, you know and he's kind of half limpy and or and i hope none of that happens i hope Cade is of healthy course. all year and balls out but if there's a real decision to be made i mean we know from the camp media day that brandon sullivan is a legitimate contender here um the way I look at the quarterback situation personally is we kind of just have a, we have two guys, as long as they're healthy, uh, we have two guys this year that give us a much higher ceiling or a much higher floor than what Deacon was giving us. And yeah. although Cade at this point in his career and Brendan all encompassing may not have a super high ceiling, either of them, the floor is higher. And so, you know, in, in other words, we might just have two guys who are much more okay than we've had the last couple of years. Um, will they be at Liberty to, to, to throw Brendan? Do you think coach Wallace or coach Lester will, will, will make that decision and throw them in? Or is Illinois state not, you know, we will go out there with no quarterback. We'll play with 10 and we'll just win with defense. And we're just not going to make the drama happen like that in week one. That's an excellent question. That's the one I probably have not spent enough time thinking about. I think that would be one of the most wild developments in a season opener in the Kirk Ferentz era. Obviously, it already is with him not being there. But to have a quarterback battle and then let's say Cade struggles or, or something, he gets, you know, they decide to replace him. The other part of me is thinking Iowa is so content throwing the ball 10 times in this game. Yep. They're going to run it down their throat. They're going to run yep. it 45 <laughs> times against this team. Because number one, the success, uh, I think Tim Lester said this back in the spring, and I think he's exactly right. The success of this year's offense will come down to the offensive line. Yep. There's there's no excuse anymore. I think Barnett got kind of thrown to the wolves when he got to Iowa. I think just yes. there were not enough starting, ca- like Big Ten starting caliber players on that O-line. Okay, they had to play guys that they didn't want to play. But now you're thinking, okay, Mason Richmond. And by the way, Mason Richmond, dog the fact that he played last season with that what lower fractured leg and did not yeah. complain or say a word to anybody i don't know how he did that that's one of the most amazing feats i've ever seen amazing and it also might it might dip a little bit into stupid but yeah i i don't disagree with that but to be a lineman to be a fullback and to be a wrestler you're wired different yeah he's nuts they're all nuts yeah 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 uh, but then you get Connor Colby. You get, I think Tyler Ellsbury had a great final run at the end of last season. Yeah. So I, I think they're really going to kind of just ride the offensive line. They're going to ride the running backs. They're going to throw the ball to Luke Lachey a little bit, kind of get him, you know, kind of get his feet back under him. I'm yeah. very curious what they do with the wide receivers because, again, Caleb Brown's not in this game either, and I still think Caleb Brown is perfect for this Tim Lester offense. Yeah. So I, I don't even know if there will be an opportunity for K to struggle enough. <laughs> Yeah. To put in Brendan Sullivan. True. True. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I don't, I don't either. And I just don't see, I don't see a scenario where like, you know, even in, in a half, in a, in a single half of Iowa football in an opening matchup against these FCS opponents, there's just not even a chance for, for Cade to be three of 14 with two picks. It's just like, it's just like, there's not, not happening. we're never going to put him in that scenario. <laughs> because we won't need to. And so it just is really, it, it really is interesting to me, the prospect of, man, what if, you know, what if Brendan came in and then all of a sudden he looked good and now KF, KF comes back into the complex on Sunday or calls, 
calls Seth Wallace on Saturday. It's night. like, what the hell? Hey, Why did you take him out? We uh, we didn't need that, huh? Didn't need that. Uh, didn't need any of that. Um, uh, but but yeah, I, I, it'll be interesting. But let's get one thing straight here, too, Tyler. This is not South Dakota State. This is not North Dakota State. This no, is a no. different caliber of FCS program. Like you could throw South Dakota State, the now South Dakota State in the Mountain West, and they're probably having a winning record or they're competing for a title. Like yeah. they are that caliber of program. I we uh I just had this conversation yesterday with Grant um on our Patreon podcast about how um about we were talking about the stallion stuff and how important knowing signals was. And I was like I, and I, it's, I brought up South Dakota state or North Dakota state. I was like, if, if you gave North Dakota state or South Dakota state, their defense, the signals of, of another team, they might be able to win a national championship at the division one level. That's how important it is yeah. when you have the other team's plays. Um, so it's, and, and it was an ode to um, those teams having enough talent, even at the FCS level to where if you have signals, you have a playbook, it, it matters that much. Um, yeah. Yeah, this is not that team. This is uh I, I don't think they're they're by any means a bad FCS program. Um, you know, and they've come I need in- to double check a stat. I did hear a stat though that they have not scored a point in their last three games against FBS opponents. Well, this would be the wrong opponent to uh to break that streak because the the defense is gonna be incredible. Um I'm super excited. Mm-hmm. Good to hear that we have health at corner as well. He he mentioned how the four corners uh, and, you know, Lester was asked about or Nestor was asked about. I'm excited to see him get reps. Obviously, TJ Hall in there as the second DB. Um, I am happy that we have health and depth there. And I think everybody's fallback here is like, well, if the offense is still like, eh, we can always fall back on the defense. It'll be fun to watch the boys play. Jay Higgins is going to light somebody up. I tweeted earlier this week, Castro is going to murder some kid in the flat. You just know. Oh, it. absolutely. Um, my last thing here is obviously Kirk won't be there. A lot of times this is used as like a, a rallying cry. And he talked about how it's like, nah, there's not going to be any rally cry here. Like they're not going to get up for this one. Like we, we approach every game the same. I have a hard time believing it. I think it's a little BS there. If I'm a player, I don't care. I don't care if it's, uh, you know, I don't care if they're lining up Cedar Rapids Kennedy against us on Saturday. If they, if Kirk's got a one, I know how those, how those guys and how we respect Kirk and love Kirk. I know for a fact that, by the way, the pregame speech that Coach Wallace is going to give is going to be fantastic. I, I, I am so jealous that he is giving that, and I'm not going to be there for that. These I'm guys are good. that they record it I, and oh. just parts of it and at least leak it. Oh, I hope so. Because um, I know people don't know Seth. Seth is outrageously entertaining and oh. he is passionate as can be. When those boys walk, when that when that door opens and the camera's on them and it's yeah, and you can hear them on the side of the student section, dun, 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 and they start coming yeah. down. The, oh, I'm getting goosebumps. By the way. Um, <laughs> this is my way of reliving the best time of my life. Uh, they are going to be the most juiced for a opener that they have in a long, long time. And, um, I think there will be a little bit of a rally on the inside. They won't say it. They're not going to talk about it. Uh, do you get that feeling as well? They downplayed it so much yesterday that yeah. I totally believe that there's something going on. Yeah. I, I just do. I think I think Kirk is not gonna get try to do anything. I think Kirk's gonna downplay it. Kirk's the one who's downplaying it. I, I think. I know how good they are at motivating on a normal week when there isn't a suspension on on KF on no, motivating this team to like really think they're in for a battle and they need to get up. Add on top of this, this this one game self imposed suspension. It's it's gonna be like Sparta. It's it's gonna be three hundred. They're walking to war and. Uh, Gosh, I Tyler, I, I, I told you, I, I picked them to score 42 in the opener. 42, huh? I, I haven't I even have looked 42. at the line. Um, we'll uh, do our, we'll do our preview. 40 and a half. Iowa is 22 and a half point favorite, which I think is low. <sighs> that, that might end up being a pick for me tonight. So on our, on our preview episodes, which we'll, we'll record tonight and we'll be out tomorrow for listeners. Um, we will do our, our Ward's winners, Kevin Ward's winners uh, segment where we all pick our games for the weekend. And 
I think Hawks by a million is going to, it's going to be a pick for this first opening weekend. Cause it just is what it is. I'm going to have to look at the lines later when we, when we set up yeah. the podcast, but it's a, it's an early, it's an early favorite there. Um, and, and one more thing about Seth Wallace too, you mentioned about how excited, you know, you were to hear that speech, you know, to see that speech and for him to get the opportunity. Yep. I think Iowa fans have really started to realize how important Seth Wallace is to Iowa. I know Phil Parker so. gets a lot of attention. I know KF realized, you know, KF's KF. But Wallace has turned down so many opportunities to go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm talking $500,000 more a year than he's even making now after the raise. Yeah. He chose – and I'm talking power two. Because there's power – no power four. I don't care about the Big 12 or the ACC. It's the SEC and Big 10. They run college football right now, okay? He's turned down other power two opportunities to be the coordinator for more money to stay at Iowa. Yeah. So I think just take a moment to relish how rare that is in college football. I, there's so many things that have yet to happen in between now and this point, but whenever KF does hang it up, I hope to God that it's Seth Wallace. And I don't, and you know, there might be other people that other, that people think are the option. I personally can't, I will not be able to see through my bias. I hope that it's Seth. It, that is who I want as our next head coach. Um, LeVar would be a great pick as well. But LeVar would probably be up there too. But the other part of it too is, Tyler, I think people need to realize Iowa, as far as a job perspective, I don't think people, the average college football fan, realizes how good of a job Iowa is. I mean, I they would don't. argue Iowa is a top 12 job in college football. I ju- top, I just, top 12, top 14, 15. It's I'd love to have that conversation on a on a regular episode with you because I just saw – and it wasn't by some like great account. It was like by, you know, it was like one of those big game boomer accounts or oh, whatever. Oh god, don't even get me started on him. It wasn't it wasn't them, but it was somebody else who who ranked the best football jobs in America. And I think I saw Iowa at like 26. And I was like I I, I yes from a fan perspective, that's 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 the opinion. That's what you think. But for coaches who actually know that's exactly and, where I was going with that. And care about fan base buy-in and department buy-in and loyalty, all the, longevity, all the resources. Things. I guarantee that coaches would consider Iowa a top fifteen job. Guaranteed. I would too. Yeah. The, I mean, you think about this: you're, you're eight and four, nine and three, year in year out. Fans are happy. Like, do you know how rare that is in college football? I think it's rare. I, I think it's a place where you could bring a new guy in and it wouldn't be this because of that longevity. It wouldn't be this grand overhaul of staff because they're looking at it like, okay, I want a couple of my guys, but these guys all know what they're doing and have been successful here for a long, like, and it might be an overhaul because that's just how things work. But um, hopefully it comes from the inside. And if you get coach Wallace or coach Woods as your next head coach, they're keeping the staff like they're going to keep it most of that staff around but conversation for another time because kf yep. is still kf is still kicking maybe not this weekend he might have his feet kicked up this weekend uh i would love to watch the game with him i wish what I do wish you think we- he's gonna do you think he's just gonna sit alone as like at home just quiet i think he's gonna sit yeah i think he's gonna sit in his living room or he'll sit in his office wherever the tv maybe he's got a tv on like the on the back patio or something and uh I think he'll just watch it from there. I really do think like it'll you know, probably have a pint of uh, Cherry Garcia ice cream. I think he'll be writing down his notes every penalty. Oh, he's writing notes. He's 100% <laughs> writing notes. It'll be interesting, though. Like it, We are going to eventually some, sometime have him on this podcast, and uh, one of the questions will be, how, how did you feel not being there for the home opener in 24? Um, you know he's going to break down, too. Yeah, yeah, he will like he'll, he'll tear up. He'll do his yeah. typical like KF kind of snort. Yeah. Where you just kind of know he's trying to trying yeah, to hide he's it. Just too. holding it all back. Yeah. You know what he should have done? He should just install like a camera of him watching the game, and then people could pay five dollars to watch yes. KF watch the game. Oh my put god. Put the proceeds to the children's hospital. We should have jumped on the opportunity and said, Coach, we'll come, we'll come live watch this game with you. The walk-ons will. And we'll just all hang out at your house and we'll get, we'll live stream that. And that would have, you know, again, $5 or or like subscribe to the Patreon. All the proceeds go to the children's hospital. We could have made so much money for the kids. Um, But anyway, that is a 30, 30 minute episode. 
I knew it would run long. Sometimes it will run long. Other times it might be short. Eichel's going to join us all year long, every week on Wednesdays for this, uh, for this little recap. Thank you, David, for joining me today. I know you're busy. You're writing stories immediately after the press conference. You got, <laughs> you got things to do. It's, it's opening weekend. I know it's busy. Uh, we're excited to see you on Friday as well. We're locked in, man. I'm, I'm ready to go. Uh, they got wait. They're on house fighting million, right? At the, at the event. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, I, need sir. To get, I need to get a four pack so I can keep that for memorabilia's sake. Yeah, for no doubt, no doubt. And everybody else listening needs to come as well. Again, Friday, 3 to 5 at Back Pocket in Coralville for Fry Fest. We'll be kicking off the season with David. Drake will be there. Grant will be there. It's going to be a great time. Thanks for listening. Main episode preview show with Ward's winners and all the betting stuff coming out tomorrow. Friday, you'll hear the 5105 show, strength conditioning side of things. Thanks for listening. We'll be back tomorrow.